God bless you guys. Uh, such a blessing to be with you. Uh, those of you whom I haven't really had the opportunity to, to meet or get to know, uh, my name is Father Steve. Look forward to really getting to know you guys over the course of this year and just really journeying with you. Uh, I've, taught, uh, I've taught RCIA, my whole priesthood, I've been a priest for, for 13 years and called it different things, RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. Um, OCIA is what the formal title is now, the Order of Christian Initiation for Adults. Um, we're, I, I, I really do prefer the, the title Becoming Catholic. It just summarizes the, this, this, this process so much more uh, succinctly. I've called it journeying to Jesus in the past, you know, and, um, and so, you know, we're all on a different walk, and I missed, I missed some of your, uh, some of your, uh, your stories, um, and I, uh, I just really want to uh, just to get to know some of you guys uh, in, in your story as, uh, as, you, as you walk in this uh, together. Uh, as we walk, as we walk together in this, okay. Can you put the the door stop and that door out there, please, just so somebody, the next person, can get in. That door. Um, so you know, we're just gonna just just walk together in this. Um, so I mean, there's there's just John, you know, shared a little bit. I, I was so I was upstairs with the uh, with the marriage group. We have a couples prayer going on up there, and. Uh, and so I'm going to, over the next six weeks, I'm going to start off up there and then come on down. Um, but, uh, you know, there's this, this process, these days, uh, ahead, the, you know, Becoming Catholic, OCIA, it's a journey. It's a journey, and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a real, uh, it's a real opportunity to, to dive into your faith, our faith. And so the Catholic Church does make a, a, a bold claim, as our, as our brother had said here up front, we make a bold claim that we hold the fullness of the faith. And I was just out on campus uh, just yesterday for three hours walking around, and uh, intro- one of the big things that I did is I just went to all of the other uh, Christian campus ministry uh, groups, and I just introduced myself to them. And, and I just said, I said, brothers, I just, I just want to welcome you to campus. A couple of them were new. And, uh, and I just said, you know, I, I, I just want us to, to be able to, to operate, to bring kids to Christ. And um, there, is, there is a lot of anti-Catholic bigotry that many of us have experienced in the past or whatnot. And, you know, and certainly some of that we, we hope to put to rest. But a lot of that comes just with experiential questions and, and, and walking and, and just asking questions. And as John had said, you know, we don't know all the answers. Um, I, don't, I don't proclaim to know everything. Uh, I am paid to know this stuff. <laughs> you know, you think of it that way. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, I'm not the, uh, I'm not, I'm, these two put me to shame in intellect and uh, I'm not a scholar or in, in any way above in that at, at, at all whatsoever. Um, but my, I just want to share just a brief bit about my own story and then dive into the topic of the day, you know, and I'm very mindful of, of the time. But so I'm, I'm 44 years old. Um, my story, it's up on my website too. You can listen to the, the fuller version of it there. But, um, you know, so I'm 44. Um, I was raised in a in a Catholic home, uh, and and raised in a home from the earliest of my memory uh, to love God. Like it was just taught and and witnessed and exemplified from my parents who are still living. Thanks be to God, I have them. Uh, that my my parents were are just loving people. Who, who modeled Christian charity and Christian love and taught me that, that the name of Christ is sacred and, and that Jesus is Lord. And I, I knew it from, from my earliest of years. And, um, and then my high school years hit and my college years hit and I, and I, I cared more about, about the party scene and, and uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I just, I just lived that life. And, and I just entered into the life of the world 
and um, got a great job at Ford, making a ton of money, giving you the abbreviated version, made a ton of money. And I, I just remember, I remember even one day just looking at my bank account and saying, there has to be more than this. And, you know, I was dating a lot and just partying. I was in the music scene and just like, just living life. And that's all that I cared about. And, and I, I just, I just remember being miserable and in, in the interior and the longer version of the story, met a girl, all of that. And, and she just really challenged me. Uh, she challenged me to live, to live chastity. And, and it was the first time I ever really heard it. And, and I wasn't living it. And she was the most anti-Catholic person I've ever met, still to this day. <laughs> Hated Catholics. And, um, and so I was working at Ford, and, and she was actually my, my boss, <laughs> which is probably inappropriate on her end. But, um, but, uh, but uh, and, and it, was, it, was, it was just this. It was, it was, the f it was beautiful because it was the first time and all of that and in recognizing that I that there was that there was something in that, and um, and in the relationship, it was she was just constantly calling me out, and I wasn't even going to church. She was just calling me out on Catholic stuff, and um, and I, I just started to explore why it was the Catholic Church taught what it teaches, to answer her, right? I don't know. I started going to church with her. I was going to, it was Life Church in Ann Arbor or wherever, started going to church with her and had, it was just um, praise and worship, a non-denominational church. And, and that, it was it, right? But it was just, just answering her questions. And one day I, I decided to, I was fixing up my house, putting in a new, new kitchen. <clears throat> my dad was with me and um, there's a lot more to the story, but I just said, Dad, I haven't been to Mass in a really long time. And he said, I know. I said, Dad, I want to go to church. And, and it's at that moment, we, so we went to, went to a later Mass, and the priest, the priest preached a homily that was piercing right to my heart. Like, he woke up that morning and said, there's a guy there who needs to hear this. And he preached to me. And... Um, and, and there's this moment in the, in, in the Mass where the priest raises up the Eucharist and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And, and I looked at the Eucharist and I said, I believe that is Jesus. I believe it. Everything that I had been co being combated with and, and just kind of studying, it was, it was all head knowledge. And at that moment, it went from my head to my heart and I just... I went up for communion, I fell to my knees, and I just received Jesus, and I came back to my pew, and I just wept, just sobbed. My dad's, you know, <laughs> sitting next to me, and he's like, what the heck are you crying for? We're just, we're just putting in tile floor and hanging cabinets, and now you're crying, what's going on? And I, and I, I said to Jesus, in, the, in, in my hands as I'm weeping, I said, Lord, I don't want to be a better man for a woman, I want to be a, I don't want to be a better man for the world. I want to be a better man for you. And I give my life to you. And I just, I just surrendered. And I remember taking my tears and, and just marking the sign of the cross in the pew. And I go back to that pew all the time when I'm back in that area. And I, and I just sit there. And I, I said to the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, I'm yours. Do with me what you want. I went back to confession and I just started living for Jesus. And, um, the furthest thing from my mind was priesthood, which is kind of part two of the story, which we can continue another time. But the furthest thing was priesthood. I, I didn't didn't think of that that I was gonna that he was gonna call me in that direction, but he did, and uh, and I'm here. So, so the Lord has something to uh, something to speak into our into our hearts through our intellect, through our mind, through our study, through the through this the sacred word of God, which many of us in in our own uh, faith traditions may have experienced in a lot of different ways. The Lord also has something to say to us in the church's teaching, right? In what she has solemnly professed <clears throat> for 2,000 years. And, and then she had, the Lord has something to say to you 
in community. Amen. That, that we want to build, you know, a, a, a community here at the tables. So some of us are, aren't walking through the RCIA or OCA program. Um, and we're just going to have some t table leaders just to help, help guide you guys along the way. And so we just want to form some small communities in that. Um, <clears throat> there's Bibles on the table. Um, because uh, we did plan to do this on rather short notice, because again, the Lord's prompting, truly the Lord's prompting, and, and those of us know what the Lord has done here very quickly. Uh, and uh, I didn't, we, we, we really, be patient with us, we really are kind of playing a little bit of catch up, but we know what we're doing. Um, I did order some, some special Bibles for you. They're called the Catholic Answer Bible. Anyone ever seen it or have one? They're really great. Uh, you'll, they'll be here next week. And then uh, a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church as well. This guy's almost done with it, so you can, you can give your copy to someone else. <laughs> so we got a catechism for you and a Bible as well. So those will be here next week. Just bring that with you. Uh, we, John emailed out the schedule to you. Uh, if you need a hard copy of that, I can certainly, we can print those out for you too. But stay close attention to that. So uh, attendance is expected, um, right? Everyone had, people have babies, people get sick, there's snow days, stuff happens. But, you know, it is an opportunity, uh, you know, when I, when I'm doing baptismal prep or I'm baptizing a child, you know, I always say that it's an, it's an opportunity of, um, not accountability, it's an opportunity of, of, of ownership, right? They, that this, this is investing in something and it's investing in the most important things. So um, John, John and Beth and Leslie are, are kind of the, the main coordinators of this and so a huge special thanks to them. Myself, Jay and them and, and others will be teaching throughout the course of this, I'll be present. <clears throat> um, and lastly, you know, there are, <clears throat> there are some of us who are here who aren't in the program, <clears throat> who aren't in the OCIA, uh, you know, table leaders and, you know, the coordinators and all that. Just the way, what I've found best is for those of us who aren't <clears throat> in, the, in the process is, uh, is, is to have them not ask questions. Uh, so that to leave the questions to those who are in the process. Okay, did you already say that, John? <clears throat> yeah, so just to, to, leave, to leave that to, uh, to those who are in the process. And um, sometimes there can be some awkward silence or whatever, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get comfortable with each other and <clears throat> we'll, we'll walk the journey together. I'll record all of my talks. They'll be, be up. Uh, you can listen to that. Maybe we'll, we can just record everything. Okay, so the, uh, we've already prayed, but why don't we just uh, pray a Hail Mary and we'll, we'll give you guys uh, all the, the prayers, the Catholic prayers. We're going to have a session on that and we'll teach you how to pray the rosary and everything. So uh, we'll, we'll learn it all. So if you don't know the Hail Mary yet, you'll learn it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Amen. <clears throat> so I, I was tasked with being the, uh, the first speaker to speak on the, the image of God, God the Father, and kind of some proofs for the existence of God. Um, and I missed a number of your, your introductions. So again, forgive me. Some of us are coming... And so now I'm going to speak blindly at this, right? So some of us are coming from absolute zero faith background. Some of us are coming from a, uh, you know, a, a non-Catholic Christian Protestant background. Some of us are in a, a higher church Protestant, Anglican, Episcopalian, High Presbyterian church. Some of us are non-denominational, you know, uh, mega church. You know, so we're all in different experiences. And, you know, that's kind of a challenge to us. You know, we got we to gotta look at that. But um, I think it's, it's always important to start <clears throat> from a groundwork of, of who God is. Right? So to understand who the Father is <clears throat> and then work, you know, with that knowledge. So one of the, one of the, great, one of the great trials that, that we face in our, in our modern day um, 
some of us are a little older than me, obviously, but uh, my, my generation, I was born in 79 in the 80s. And, uh, you know, the you 70s babies and any 60s babies, a couple 60s babies, right? <clears throat> you 60s flower power people, um, you know, you're, you know, it's the same thing in that generation that uh, the greatest struggle is, is, a, is a father wound. There's a, there's a lot of father wounds in our hearts, daddy wounds. And, 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 and a lot of that's derived to our own earthly father. But in that daddy wound, we attribute that back to God the Father. And the most important thing that, that we as believers in the Lord Jesus, as sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father that we can take away is that we are His and we have a good, good Father who claims us and who loves us. And so as we carry those, that woundedness in a very real way, real woundedness, as we carry that, um, we have an opportunity to be healed in that if we can offer that brokenness to a father who doesn't scold us, who doesn't beat us, who doesn't harm us, who doesn't yell at us, who didn't abandon us, who loves us in great, great mercy. So, um, so looking at, at God the Father first, right? So, so we have to say a little bit about the Holy Trinity, and we're going to have a whole, a whole course on the Trinity itself, um, but, it, but, but knowing that, right, so that, that we cannot speak of, of God without speaking of the, 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 the triune Godhead, as, as we would say. So it, it isn't something that, that we as Catholics take lightly. So we are Trinitarian. We have, you know, followed the councils of Nicaea all the way through. Um, all of the all of the the church's teaching, Constantinople, the Nicene Creed, all of these, all of the the councils, to understand the Trinit the Trinitarian teaching that God is one in three, three in one, and that we uh, that we do not believe in three gods. You know that's a that's a uh, that is a claim that that Muslims make, Jews even make against us. Uh, non-believers, you know, the Christians, Catholics believe in three gods. You know, God, God, the God, 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 His Son, and the God, the Holy Spirit. Three gods. We do not believe in three gods. God is one in three, three in one. Again, we're going to go into more detail on that on the Trinity. But Jesus is the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. Three persons in one Godhead. The Father is the first person of the Trinity. Jesus is the second person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. <clears throat> so three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So person, it's very important that we, that we recognize that, that, that the council, these, I speak of ancient councils, Council of Constantinople and, and Nicaea defined our triune belief in God. And I, don't, I can't remember the dates of that, but it was in the, the third and fourth century. Okay, So in that, they define the word person. Okay, persona. Person, and it's important. So person answers the question, who is that? Nature answers the question, what is that? All right, so who is that? Okay, so... I can look at, at Beth over there, right? So Beth in this crowd, okay? I can ask the question, who is that? That's Beth. Who is that? That's Beth. What is that? She's a human. She's a woman, right? So again, nature answers, what is that? And again, we'll break much more of that down as we look into the, into the Trinity, but in the Godhead, three distinct persons, three distinct, uh, three distinct who's exist, okay? Three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they have always been. They have always existed before time. So God, the Father, did not predate the Son. The Son did not predate the Son. They have existed for all eternity, 
um, existed before time. So the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is neither the Father and the Son, right? <clears throat> God sends his Son, Jesus, to do something. Um, he sends his Son to do something. A person, a divine person. I am a human person. You are a human person. And then there is the angelic persons, right? Angelic persons. And, and so Jesus is sent to do something. What is, what is Jesus' name? What is, I'm sorry, what's Jesus' name? What does Jesus' name mean? Anyone know what his name means? God saves, God saves right? So God saves. So he sends, he sends his son. <clears throat> he sends his son to do something, to save. And, and what's in a name? A name is, is sacred, especially in the, in the scriptures. God, names are sacred, and it means everything. Names always have meaning to them, and, and, and according to all culture. Um, and so God's very name is who he is, and it's what he does. And so the Lord has come to save you and me from sin and death, from, uh, from hopelessness and despair, to save us from, uh, from agony to give us hope, to give us life. And he's come because he has been sent. That's important. He has come because he has been sent. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus comes to do one thing. He comes to do one thing. And throughout, and some of us have never even picked up a Bible. Throughout, uh, Jesus comes to do one thing. And throughout his entire life, throughout this entire beautiful book, he's just telling us why he's come. I've come to save you, and I've come to reveal the Father. I've come to reveal who God is. So if you have a pen and paper, <clears throat> I just want to go through a, a, a couple scriptures here, first of all, and I'm going to read them. You don't have to go through your Bible. We don't have to go through all of that, but why don't we just write them down first of all? I'll give them to you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. First one is Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15, Second, that's 1 colon 15, um, <clears throat> chapter 1.15 is what that means. The Gospel of John, John 1 colon 18, <clears throat> John 14.8, John 12, colon 45. <coughs> Luke 11, 1 through 4. <coughs> Matthew 6, 21 through 34. And lastly, Matthew eleven twenty seven. <clears throat> We're going to start in Colossians one fifteen. Again, you don't you don't have to go there. <clears throat> I'll read it for us. Okay. Go back to fourteen. I got one. <clears throat> in whom in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is in the image of the invisible God from the firstborn of all creation. Let's jump back to you know, verse 13. <clears throat> he delivered us from the power of darkness and transformed, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is in the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all cre creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible. <clears throat> so in that, um, this, that is, this is who Jesus is. He is the impression of the invisible God. He makes the, vis the invisible visible <clears throat> in his very presence. Second one, John uh, chapter 1. I'm just going to blow through these, okay? So John 1.18 
John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only, the only Son of God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed him. Why did Jesus come? To reveal the Father. And Jesus is always pointing back to this. <clears throat> God has no body, no, no body. Um, the only begotten Son, the divine Son, the, the one nearest to the Father, has revealed the Father in his glory. Okay? And so um, we've all seen, you know, really tacky pictures, perhaps even of, of God the Father. And um, art has tried to depict that. There's probably even one in this Bible. There's kind of a famous one of, you know, it's kind of tacky 60s edition of just the father holding the son. Um, and, and, and again, you know, in, in Christianity, that, that's a beautiful thing that to, to try to, to, to make those images. But at the same time, the father doesn't have an image. And the, the son has revealed him. Okay, next one, just a, uh, a little bit behind, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit forward. John chapter 14, verse 8. 14, verse 8. So, f so the context of this uh, is good to know. So this is in John chapter 14. This is the, this is the, uh, the, the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, um, this, is, this is right before Jesus' betrayal. Right before his, one of his best friends completely betrays him. And Judas, Judas is, is in preparation of that. And Jesus is, is fulfilling, the, uh, fulfilling the Father's command to prepare his, his people for the Paschal sacrifice. We're going to get into all of that. But, uh, but so, the, so Jesus is receiving this question from one of his best friends, Philip. So Philip says to him, Master, what's he going to ask him? Show us the Father. <laughs> Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus says to him, have I, have I been with you for so long a time, and still you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say to us, say to me, Show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. These are Jesus' words right before he dies, that he is equal to the Father. That he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. We're going to jump back just two chapters. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 45. <clears throat> Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me, <clears throat> not only believes in me, but also in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. Whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. And so trying to get, a, trying to get clear here that, that Jesus is never pointing just to himself, but, but that he's pointing to another. He's pointing the way back home, back to the Father, always pointing to the one, the one who sent him. For this reason, this is why I have come. This is why I have come. Luke 11, <clears throat> Luke 11, 11, 1 through 4. So this is important, right? So the sacred scriptures are clear that, that Jesus makes himself equal with the Father. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the apostles are asking Jesus how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray. Or at a certain place, Lord, teach us how to pray. John taught his disciples, and he said to them, when you pray, Jesus said to them, and when you pray, pray like this. Father, hallowed be thy name hallowed be your name your kingdom come right so that's so important who is god he is father and in in the way that jesus chooses to teach his beloved how to pray is in the father okay and and lastly um 
Lastly, oh, I'll end on that next one. So, yeah, so lastly, Matthew chapter 6. There's a couple more, but we'll end with Matthew chapter 6. Got to get moving here. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, uh, 25 through 34. Anyone ever experienced anxiety before in their lives? Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Read Matthew chapter 6. I'm sorry. I went to Matthew 25. Matthew 6, 25 through 24. So, so this is all about anxiety of the world. How do, what does this have to do with, with the Father? <clears throat> Dependency on God. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food, body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow and reap? They gather nothing into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, are you not worth more than they? Are you not more important than those sparrows? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single moment onto your lifespan? Why are you anxious about clothes? Learn from the way that the wildflowers grow. They do not work and spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor. So, so Jesus, I just want to skip down here. All of these things the pagans seek, yet your heavenly Father knows all that you need. But first, seek the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and these things will be given to you. So Jesus, uh, Jesus is, uh, is, is pointing the way to the Father and that the Father knows what we need because the Father is good. Because the Father is good. <clears throat> we can turn to this. Open up our uh, very first book of the Bible. It's on page 8 in your red Bibles, if you want to grab that. <coughs> Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 1. <coughs> I had, a, uh, I had a college girl ask me the other day, she said, she said Father, what do you recommend? Uh, you know, I've never really read the Bible. I don't know much about the Bible. W where, where can I start? It's kind of daunting. What's your recommendation? My recommendation is always, if you, if you want to, first of all, I recommend you read the Bible. Uh, my, my recommendation is to read Genesis and Exodus. You get a beautiful understanding of what God has done, how he's created us. Genesis and Exodus, and then to give hope, go to the New Testament. I always recommend the Gospel of Luke and then Acts because they just follow right back and forth, okay? So um, they're a continuation, if you will. But Luke, in Luke, we all, we all love Christmas, so we, we hear the nativity story. We, we know the birth of Jesus, and then in the book of Acts, we see the, the culmination of, of the Christian people, <clears throat> how, they have to, how they should respond. And so there's your first four, bo four books, your first bit of homework. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the whole wind I'm sorry, the darkness covered the abyss while the mighty wind swept. Okay? So we can see that there are two creation stories also, if you knew that. So if you look down in, in chapter 2, there's a second creation story. At the time, chapter 2, verse, uh, we'll just kind of, um, chapter 2, verse 4. At the time when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, while as yet there was no field or shrub on, on the earth and no grass in the field that sprouted, for the Lord God had sent rain, no rain upon the earth. <clears throat> so there's two separate creation stories. Does that mean that there's two gods? Does it mean one God created one thing, one God created another? No. You know, so there's a lot of different understandings, a lot of different theories, but... Um, what it, what, it, what it shows, and in, in, it is clear, so what, what Catholics, what we believe is in very important, 
um, that we believe that that there was a creation that that mankind did not sprout out of nothing we were created by god um, now the retelling of that story has no bearing bearing of of uh, necessity upon the truth so the you know, the, the very fact that we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels are the, the telling of the, the, the life of Jesus in the New Testament. So the, the scriptures are broken up Old Testament, New Testament. And the Old Testament is, is the story of how God created the world, how the world fell into sin, all the telling of God trying to win back his people. Then he sends his son to win us back. And then it's the telling of that redemption story. <clears throat> so there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the witnesses tell that story differently. If you and I were standing out on the corner over here of Squirrel and, uh, and Walton, and we witnessed a car accident, uh, Beth, and Jay, and I would all say, yeah, you know, the, the, the white car hit the black car. But Jay's going to be like, no, 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 no. The, the black car ran the red light and she's going to say, no, but that red car almost hit the black car that made the white car swerve. So we're going to all say, yeah, the, the, he kid him, but we're all going to tell that story differently. And that's exactly what's, what's taking place with the creation story. They're not, they're not combating. It's, a, it's just a different take in a, in, a, in a poetic sense of God's creation. <clears throat> but, the, uh, but, the, but the point here, is that God creates us out of love, not out of need. If we, if we read the creation story, we can see the beauty of creation. Uh, I was talking with my, with my doctor. I have some medical stuff going on. I'm going to have some big surgery coming up here at the end of the month. Um, and, uh, and I was talking with my doctor, and <clears throat> she, uh, we were just talking about how in the medical world, in the medical world, most doctors are believers. There's atheists and there's, there's certainly there's, a, there's a, a push for a lot of anti-Christian medicine and all of that. Trust me, it's there. But in the medical world, especially with nurses too, they're the ones who actually deal with the patients. They're not just dealing with, with stuff. But in the medical world, most of them are believers because they see the human body and they see the, the dynamics of it, and they've seen miracles, but they've seen, they, they see life come in, into, into existence, and they see life fade away. And there's something, there's something real about that. In the psychological world, in the world of, of the mind, and if you just stay in your head, psychologists and, and a lot of philosophers are atheists because they just try to talk themselves into anything and out of everything, right? So God creates out of, out of love, not out of need. He doesn't need me, but he loves me. For some reason, me. <laughs> me. Foul, bearded, cranky Father Steve, right? He, he loves me, um, and I don't need to earn his love. Right? Just because I'm a priest doesn't mean I'm getting to heaven. I don't, I don't, but I don't need to do stuff to earn his love. He's already loved me by sending his son. And, and we as Catholics, you know, it's not this one saved, always saved for us. But at the same time, it is this gift of acceptance of Jesus in, into my life. And that now I make this choice to follow him. And as we heard in James 2 here, that from my love of him and my service of him, then my works will be poured out. I'll give up wife and family and home and money and all that and follow him and, and other things. <clears throat> so God creates also effortlessly here. He says, let there be light and there is light. He is exercising his, his divine will. He's creating and so we see that transposed in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus. Jesus says, rise, Lazarus, be healed. Let there be, let there, uh, let there be light. It's the same power. God the Father and God the Son are one. I've come to reveal the Father. I've come, uh, Philip, you, you have seen me when you have seen the Father. 
And so things were created, are, are, and then lastly, all things that God has created are for the good. Everything God has created is for the good, but the devil distorts it. Everything God has created, God doesn't create junk. Everything is good. Every man, every woman, every child is good. And that's the horror of abortion. That's the horror of, of um, you know, so we're seeing just a, a, a huge increase of, of, um, of aborting um, Down syndrome children. And the Netherlands and uh, in the Nordic countries up there, they brag about having a 0% birth rate of Down syndrome children. Why? because they're aborting them all. <laughs> but they're good, and they're beautiful, and they're joyful, <laughs> and they bring happiness to, and harmony to the home. So uh, God is also his creator. Uh, so he, as a creator, um, is greater than anything else in which he has created. Um, he exists outside of time. He exists outside of time and space and matter. And he's, he's, he's greater than anything else that he's created. Um, so time, space, and matter, okay? Um, so, uh, so time is about when, space is about where, and matter is about what. Time, space, and matter. So in that singular sentence there in, uh, in, in Genesis 1-1, we get... We get the when in the beginning, right? In the beginning. When was it? The beginning. God created before all, God was before all time. He didn't come into existence. We're going to talk about this ever so briefly because it's getting late. Um, but he is the unmoved mover. He is. He is. Okay? And so, so the when, we get the where. where. Where is he? The heavens. He created the heavens when God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? We get the where, the, the where. And then we get the what. He created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless wasteland and darkness covering, covered by the abyss while the mighty wind swept over the waters. And in that earth, it includes us. So we get, we get the, the, the when, the where, and the what. All right there in the very beginning, the very beginning of, of Genesis. Um, and this begins our journey, truly, to understand who this God is. Who this God, who says that he loves us, who proclaim or who who profoundly sends his son for us um, it begins our journey into knowing Jesus's voice in this of saying this is why I have come to reveal him to reveal this God this father this mighty one who says let there be light and there's light who was there before the beginning, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. <clears throat> so, um, on, your, uh, on your, your handouts there, I gave you, um, give you a really great book, uh, a really great uh, printout here from, a, um, from a, uh, a, a Catholic priest named Luigi Giussani. He wrote a great book called... Um, Called, I think it's called uh, the the Lord Jesus Christ, and so this is just kind of just the origin of the Christian claim. It's not super deep. Some of us may think so, but it, it's it's awfully beautiful. Um, this second book here is from a, a a commentary on the Gospel of Saint Matthew, and again, it's just looking at the Our Father, just looking through what we just kind of walked through, giving you some uh, some beautiful. Uh, some beautiful scripture or some uh, Greek analysis of that. Uh, I can't remember the, the author's name. His first name is Erasmus. Erasmus Meritikakis is the author of that. Um, that's a, it's a really dynamic book. And then uh, this, this third thing here 
is from if you're if if you like to read, this is truly a a great book of it's a handbook of Christian apologetics. I just I photocopied it for you, and um, you can pass this around if you want to. So this comes from chapter three, um, chapter three in that about the just the different arguments of the existence of God. So write this name down. You can write this on there. Doctor Dr. Period Peter Doctor Peter Kreft K R E E F T Doctor Peter Kreft 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 doesn't matter how you say it. Uh, so he is. Anyone know who C. S. Lewis is? Heard of C. S. Lewis? So he is. He's. He truly is the modern day C. S. Lewis. He's a. He's a philosopher. He's a theologian. He's. He's a. He's a retired philosopher from. Uh, from Boston College. He's awesome. I mean, he's awesome. So he has a website with all 20 of these arguments. And so his website, I think it's petercrave.com. We can check in and say, is it petercrave.com? I think it is. Yeah, but if, even if you just search 20 arguments for the existence of God, Peter Kraft, it'll come up, okay? And uh, so, so he lists all of them. You can, you can click on them all, and then the, the, he's expanded it from, from that book, which I think is the, the first copy of that. It's probably from, uh, from 15, 20 years ago. So I want to read, uh, I, I read the arguments, the second argument on here, um, the, the second argument of, uh, of causality with you, all right? And I, I don't want to bore you. I don't want to bog us down. Um, and Jay, again, who's much smarter than I am, can, can kind of help us kind of navigate some of this too. But, uh, but I, I, just, I do want to read this with you, okay? We notice, <clears throat> we notice that some things cause other things to be to begin to be or and continue to be or both. For example, a man playing a piano is causing the music that we hear. If he stops, so does the music. Now ask yourself, are all things caused to exist by other things right now? Suppose they are. That is, suppose there is no uncaused being, no God, then Nothing could exist right now. For remember, on the no God hypothesis, all things need a present cause outside of themselves in order to exist. So right now, all things, including all those things which are causing other things to be, need a cause. They can have being, they, I'm sorry, they can, they can give being only so long as they are, are given being. Everything that exists, therefore, on this hypothesis, stands in need of being caused to exist. But caused by what? Beyond everything that is, there can only be nothing. I want to repeat that. Beyond everything that is, there can only be nothing. But that is absurd of all reality dependent, but no dependent on nothing, but dependent on nothing, the hypothesis that all being is caused, that there is no caused being is absurd. So there must be something uncaused, something on which all things that need an efficient cause of being are dependent. Existence is like a gift given from cause to effect, <clears throat> if there is no one who has the gift, the gift cannot be passed down the chain of receivers, however long or short the chain may be. If everyone is to borrow a certain book, but no one actually has it, then no one will ever get it. If there is no God who has existence by his own eternal nature, then the gift of existence cannot be passed down the chain of creatures pass down the chain of creatures and we can never get it but we do get it we do exist therefore there must exist a god an uncaused being who does not have to receive existence like us and like every other link in that chain of receivers so then there's kind of like saint thomas aquinas does there's like a 
point counterpoint point counterpoint and uh, and so so there's a couple other proofs that I gave you here but do check out that website Rachel? so what's interesting about these all these arguments are purely philosophical they have nothing to do with the Bible they have nothing to do with revelation these are just reflections on why there has to be a God whatever God would be like and so all of these are, are completely intellectual arguments and you can go through them and think about them they get more complicated and more subtle um, but all, all you know all you have to do is, is find one of them that really resonates with you to give you that conviction uh, that that this is not only plausible but it's very likely that there is a God and then the next step is what we talk about once you believe there's a God then, then the whole thing is about Jesus right we'll talk a lot about Jesus over the course of this year and once you you believe yep Jesus was here Jesus existed Jesus lived a great life all these miracles then that makes you Christian and then once you're Christian then we start talking about the Catholic so it's really a process depending on where you're starting and what you're thinking, where the issues are that are most relevant to you at that point as you work along this spiritual path. But anyway, I just think it's interesting to kind of reflect on the fact that these are just intellectual arguments, um, that there has to be a reason why we exist, and it isn't dependent on all of the other things that we will, of course, believe as well, but, but that's not where this is coming from. This is, this is you know, Aristotle <coughs> Has anyone ever heard of Pascal's Wager? Only one of us. So Pascal's Wager, so my two favorite proofs of God's existence is the existence of causality. Something has to exist in order for, for me to exist. So that means God is sustaining you and me to be here right now. I only exist because the Almighty wants me to, which means I am loved. And even the most hardened of sinner, God is willing him to exist. Please, God, that he repents and comes back to him. And then Pascal's wager, so Pascal, uh, Blaise Pascal was a French uh, philosopher in the, uh, in the late 1600s, 1700s. But he, he's famous on a very it's very basic, and it, I mean, it gets a little more intricate, but it's very basic. But, but he says, oh, it's very simple. Um, it, it's a wager. Um, you bet if there is no God, and then all of a sudden you close your eyes and you meet God, you have lost. And then you bet that there is a God, and then you close your eyes and there's darkness, you won. You bet that there is you, you bet that there is a God, you close your eyes in death, you open them, and there is a God, you've also won. So then, therefore, the odds are two to one in your favor, so bet on that there is a God and live like there's a God, and you still live a happy life. <laughs> so, very simple, very basic, and it's, it, makes, uh, it makes for the Christian life uh, to be, to be uh, one of reward. Any, uh, any thoughts, comments, questions on, uh, on our relationship with God the Father? I had to cut a few things out just on time, but I think we're fine. So do we face a lot of questions in, um, in our daily lives with, with the existence of God? A lot of people question or challenge you in, in, your, in the workplace. A lot of the classic 
why there's all the bad happening in the world, right? That's a big classic, I feel like. Mm-hmm. There's, we're plagued in our world today with something called moralistic therapeutic deism, which is a, uh, a, a, a common term that's used in the Catholic world to define philosophically, to define what we're experiencing now. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic, I just really just, we're all, we should, I just want to be a good person. I don't want to, I don't want to offend anyone. I don't, I'm not, I'm not killing anyone. I've never, never raped anyone. I've never harmed, I've never kicked a dog. I'm just a good person. Why would God send someone like me to hell? Therapeutic, that I, I, I do have a relationship with God. And I'm just kind of, I go to him and it just, it's just like therapy. It makes me feel good about myself and you feel good about yourself and I'll feel good about myself. And you know, that, that's just kind of our, our relationship with, with God. And, and then deism is just a classic age old understanding that, that God is distant. He's the clockmaker. He's the watchmaker that he just wound up the world. He didn't create the world. Let there be light. He didn't create out of goodness. He wound up the clock and stepped back and said, go have at it. He's not there. He's not listening to me. And so we're plagued in the modern world with that understanding that, that, that when, I, I, when I call out to God, he doesn't listen to me anyway. So why pray? Why be a good person? Why, why live an a authentically moral life? And, and God, religion is just, you know, just to make me feel good about myself. So uh, you do you, I'll do me. But the, res- the, the response to the gospel message is that Jesus Christ has come to conquer death and sin and the devil. And in that, the world's been created, it has fallen, and now recreated good. And that I can have life in this world and in the next if I, if I follow him, if I love him, and as Catholics, as, as we live in grace, sacramental grace, which the church gives us, which is, which is grace and anointing, blessing poured out from heaven. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't want to keep talking. Any other thoughts? Jay. Jay, Jay, sorry, I apologize. But uh, when it says that these arguments are like something you don't need to like read the Bible for, it's something that's like independent of revelation. So it's something that like people say, oh, like you believe in God because like the Bible, it's like faith is just like a thing you either do or don't have. But like certain aspects of the faith, like the existence of God and the, um, certain qualities of God are can be derived completely independently of revelation um, and that's called natural theology and even Plato um, had some idea of heaven some idea of the beatific vision through just natural theology but then stuff that pertains to revelation like who God is who Jesus is that's fundamentally revelation and you can position yourself to more credibly believe in it like more uh, dispose yourself to believe in it more but it ultimately still is um it still is just from God alone, and it is um, all grace alone. And in this reading, when it says, who do you say I am? You are the Christ. In Matthew, it says, flesh and blood has not revealed this, but God himself has revealed it to you. Uh, so it shows that like the actual act of faith is from God alone. I just wanted to add that distinction, because when I came into the church, I thought you could just kind of like come to this scientific knowledge that Jesus is God, doesn't really work that way. I hope that didn't extend it too much, but okay. Briefly. Yeah, um, just real quick, I think uh, when we talk about our world today, because like some of the reading in the gospel message, it's kind of like we know we were created by, by God who loves us so deeply, um, and mankind, uh, like, like we sinned against God, and so that's like that's the, the capture of mankind. And you can actually see that play out in our world today, where someone might, like an alcoholic is used an example, like someone might start wanting to drink and like in that, like they slowly decline, like three, like four, like ten, they become captive to their sin, and like that's kind of how sin works: is is people like refusing to go away from God and thinking things you know that aren't good, 
they can become kind of captured and enslaved to their vices. But that's where God didn't abandon us. He took on human flesh and died for us. And think about that incredible love that, like, for you individually, that God took, took on flesh and suffered horribly and died for you. And so then just, like, that's really the heart of our faith is, is how do we as, as Christians, how do we live our, our lives in a loving response to what God did for us? Amen. Last. just to ask yourself, what who do I see God as? Who is, who is God to me? Um, to see a judge, to see a, to see the king, to see the, you know, wh- whatever it is. And just like, let God help to reveal himself to you quietly. Not just to the guru, because they're beautiful, but to your heart. Yeah. Take the time to say, like, you know, show me the Father. That's beautiful. Yeah, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. God bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus, we praise your glorious name and continue to give us strength to know that you have revealed the Father and show show us the face of the Father, Lord Jesus, as we walk this journey with you. We ask it all in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.